Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. We have with us Aaron Van Worden. He is the technical editor at the Bitcoin Magazine, uh, where I used to be a general editor. And so we kind of have a little bit in common there. Welcome to the podcast, Aaron. Yeah, thanks for having me, Trace. So you have a background in history, studied freedom of speech, and how communication structures and technologies impact our social structures and our political systems. And you're also a journalist in the Bitcoin space, like myself. What got you interested in writing about and explaining Bitcoin to uh, the general audience? So it was back in 2013 that I first heard about Bitcoin. And at first, I heard about it through friends who were just buying stuff from Silk Road. They were buying like, cheap cigarettes or something from Moldavia. And uh, I was a starting journalist, basically. And I was just looking for stories. And I was interested in internet stuff, like you mentioned, like how something just caught my eye. So I started reading about Bitcoin to write the story. And the more I read about it, the more I became fascinated by this whole idea that this is actually a new type of money, a new way of doing money that basically blew my mind at the time. I hadn't really thought about money that much back in 2013. And the whole idea that you could do money differently, that, that was very interesting. So then I decided that one article wasn't going to cut it. Bitcoin was getting popular at the time, like the April bubble was sort of developing and I was, so at the same time I was starting to read stories about Bitcoin in the mainstream press, but they were bad. They were, or they were at least seeing something very different from what I was seeing. Where my mind was blown, they just saw like a scam or a bubble and with pretty weak arguments. So then I thought, okay, I'm just going to counter their arguments. I'm going to write a blog post series in Dutch at the time, sort of explaining why it's not a Ponzi scheme, why it's why it's actually interesting, why this is something to keep an eye on, even if Bitcoin wouldn't be the one that, that would take over the world. At that time, I had no, I had only learned about it a couple of weeks or, or so, but I knew this was going to be, uh, this was an interesting thing and I wanted to explain it. So I started in Dutch, just that sort of articles, and then over time, I started writing in English for Coindesk, Cointelegraph, and ultimately Bitcoin Magazine. So with your background in history and politics, focusing on freedom of speech, which is kind of a big issue for me. Yeah, you were a big free speech buff, uh, yeah, or you, you still you are, are, I guess. Yeah. And, and I suppose it comes, you know, we had the, the free speech movement really was in Holland and then went up into England and then came over to America. So, I mean, that's kind of when you track the history of it with the University of Salmanac and stuff. I mean, looking at that, like what part of Bitcoin's potential do you find most interesting in terms of this intersection with freedom of speech? I don't really see a strong intersection with freedom of speech apart from the fact that Bitcoin in a way is freedom of speech. Like it's, it's freedom of information, right? Like you're, you're doing money as speech. It, it's all of a sudden becoming the same thing, which is interesting. Well, I mean, because um, we also have like, what about the ability to to fund web servers or even just having the information yeah. out there and being able to pay for it, right. you know, when you, when you aren't using centralized third parties. Cause we saw like with WikiLeaks, for example, in the banking blockade that they wielded the financial and monetary systems to silence freedom of speech. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah. I mean, the reason I didn't immediately connect it to is because they can still publish without the, this monetary instruments. It just, they wouldn't be getting any money for it. So, but it's still a very stifling thing if you can't, can earn any money by what you're doing. But yeah, I, I would, I would see the internet itself as a strong means for freedom of speech itself. Like that, that's, that's what enables it. Bitcoin helps in these regards for sure. Yeah. But it's an interesting connection that I, I didn't immediately make. Yeah, so as a BTC journalist, how do you reconcile your opinion that Bitcoin's good and helpful with the, all of the negative news that we see from a lot of the more established uh, journalist outlets that are 
in the in the field. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, this is why I got into writing about Bitcoin, because I was seeing this big disconnect between what I was seeing in the main, mainstream press and what I was seeing myself. I gave a talk about this recently. I think there's not one single reason why the press about Bitcoin is generally so negative. There's a lot of reasons. And I think it's not really because there's some kind of conspiracy against Bitcoin going on. It just has more to do with the nature of journalism and how they, how journalists approach their subjects that, that has a negative influence. For example, well, one obvious thing is bad news sells. It's just, this is cases. Very it gets more clicks. Yeah. It's a very, that's a very ingrained thing in human psyche where, you know, over, over the course of evolution, uh, it was very important to notice bad news. Like if there's a tiger in the bushes, it's very important to notice that because otherwise you're dead. While good news isn't as, doesn't need the same level of attention immediately. So for, for clickbaity journalism we're, we're heading to, especially because, yeah, so that's an important point. 20 years ago, people would still pay for a journalism. And then there was a bigger tendency to pay for quality. While now people, the, the journalists just get paid by clicks. So bad news will get clicks because it will sort of draw the attention of readers that want to see what's going on. They want to see if they're in some kind of danger. Bad news draws attention. That's, that's one very obvious thing. But there's also, um, the news cycle is generally focused on short term stuff. Again, the news of the day is something that people will want to read, like what's going on today. While a bigger trend that's, it's more expensive to write these kinds of articles, to do the kind of research, to get this on paper. Uh, and it will generally not get the same level of immediate attention as the sort of news of the day. And I've found that in Bitcoin, the sort of short term news of the day kind of stuff is much more often bad news. Uh, you know, you've got your exchange hacks, you've got your price crashes, you've got negative stuff while the longer term trend of you know doing a new time of money building a new protocol for the internet which i think is a more interesting perspective just not doesn't fit in the same news news cycle as well yeah so i mean looking at how history is repeated over time what has happened in bitcoin's past that might give us some insight into bitcoin's future and then also looking at that in the context of the larger cycles of history too. Yeah, that, so the the most obvious, if if I if I'll start with the larger cycles of history, the most notable or the most obvious, maybe in a way, I don't know if it's obvious, but the most notable comparison I see is with the printing press, like the Bitcoin and printing press. Like, there's these things in 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 human society that don't actually exist, but they exist because we all believe they exist. They're shared fictions. So a state is a good example of a shared fiction. It's, it's sort of there because we all believe it's there, but also much smaller things like football club. The football club is there because we all believe it's there. Like they all wear the same jersey and that's why it's sort of a thing, but you can't actually define what makes it. You know, maybe it's all insult people, I don't know, but or a religion sort of a shared fiction that will, you know, we all wear the same clothes or eat the same stuff. And just it exists because it exists in people's, people's minds. Which I think is still a form of existence in a way. Like if we all act because we believe this thing is there, then it's sort of there. And so it's interesting if you have a new technology that kind of changes how these shared fictions can work or how they're defined. Or so religion, for example, before the printing press was really defined by the church. It was really a, a, a top-down kind of thing where the church and the state was also one thing. They sort of explained what the religion was and what people were supposed to do. And sometimes it meant people had to pay like special taxes to get in the afterlife or that sort of stuff. And then when the printing press came along, there was a different way to uh, define the shared fiction by printing, actually printing the Bible and having people read, read it. And that's ultimately, and then you had Martin Luther who, who spread his sort of ideas of what's wrong with the church. And then people had a new way of interpreting the shared fiction and that's how the Reformation happened. And you see sim similar things going on in, in the United States, for example. So there's a big difference in how the printing press spread through the United States, where it was really something that the people, the commons could use. Or for example, in South America, where it was really uh, controlled by the state. 
and, and the church, church and state. So in the in South America, they kept a much stricter hold on who got to print information, and in the United States, were very free. And you see, to this day, or at least to, until like a century ago, there was a very so in the United States, because of this information for free, they were sharing ideas of what a state should be, like John Locke's ideas and uh, what, what a state should look like. And the founding fathers was, were reading this and it was getting in people's minds. And they they came up with a new way of doing a state, right? So that the Constitution and all that sort of stuff. And in South America, they didn't have that because the church and the state were still controlling how people learn about information. And you see that had a very big effect until like... Well into the 20th century, a lot of Latin American countries were more hierarchically uh, structured than the United States, which were more of an equal and free society. So another shared fiction is money. That's a very obvious shared fiction. Uh, you know, it doesn't actually exist apart from the fact that we all sort of agree it exists. And you, you exchange stuff that's real in exchange for money, which is sort of something well, we just agree on. Well, we have the exact same piece of paper. We just have different numbers printed on it. And ascribe different value to them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Which is, which is just, it has a different value because we agree it has a different value, right? But it doesn't have so, necessarily a different weight. Right. Uh, I mean, no. we, we might have one pound of gold or two pounds of gold, but if we have a $1 bill and a $2 bill, the only real difference is the organization of the ink. From a one yes, to a absolutely, two. yeah. Well, and, and that we agree that's a different thing. Yeah, and we have this distributed consensus. Yeah, right. So, so in Bitcoin, uh, and, and blockchain, maybe you can include that. I don't know. That gives us a new way of defining the shared con- the shared fiction of money. And now, now we have a new way of doing money. So in the same sense that the printing press gave people new ways to think about the state and the church, now we have a new way of thinking about money. And that could have big consequences like I said, uh, this stuff can go on, like have influence centuries later where it works. So, and that's not really, we're in the very early stage of Bitcoin right now. I think, I mean, it could fail next year. We don't know, but assuming that it won't, then we're in very, very early stages. An interesting thing about technology and history is also that sometimes decisions are made in the early stages of a technology and then because of this decision, it sort of evolves into a certain direction and this t- technology will go one way or the other. And then in res- retrospect, everyone will think it's obvious. That was like the obvious evolution, but it wasn't necessarily obvious at the time. So an interesting example is the bicycle. You've seen these pictures of these bicycles with these big wheels, like the big front wheel and the very small back wheel. And people tend to think that this was like a first type of bike. And then they figured out the two eagle size wheels is much better and sort of evolved that way. But actually, back in the days, there was a debate on which way to go with bicycles. Like, should it have a big wheel and a small wheel, or should it have equal wheels? And they both had different properties. Actually, the big wheel bike was faster and, and more agile, like it was a racing thing. And the other one was more practical. So, anyways, the two, uh, the two wheel bike, for some reason, I don't know the exact details of this issue, but that became kind of the more popular one or that, and then from then on, that design was improved and improved and improved and improved until now that's like the obvious thing that everyone uses. So there's an early, early thing that happened there, which, and now we just have one bike and that's two wheels, even racing bikes have, have these two wheels. And so for the, for Bitcoin, it's interesting that if, if we assume that we're in very early stages right now, then you can also look at Bitcoin and decisions that are being made in Bitcoin that could have these kinds of consequences uh, that down the road. So an, so an example would be like the block size debate, right? We've had this big block size debate. And there was this argument that maybe it would be fine to just do a hard fork to, to MB. Like small hard fork, you know, what's the harm? And it's, it's probably right that there isn't necessarily that much harm to doing small hard fork apart from the fact that it's impossible because you can't get everyone to agree. But like in itself, it's, it might be fine. But then when you do set this, you do sort of go down this road maybe that next time blocks fill up, we'll just do another hard fork and we'll just increase it more. And then, and then, and then that will sort of be the evolution of Bitcoin until the point that people can't actually uh, verify their own transactions, you know, run full notes and, and it could actually become a sort of centralized thing. So I, I just see a interesting that, that debate could have been very interesting, like even 50 years down the road, like Bitcoin could look very different 
50 years down the road because of the decisions we've sort of made now. Or... And couldn't this also be, say, uh, onion routing in the Lightning Network? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, these kinds of things. The decisions you make today will it will be harder to 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 build that in later. Yeah. yeah, and if I recall correctly, Satoshi said that the design is pretty much set, but but certain things were made possible because of different trade offs he made when he initially set that design. So, I mean, even from the very early days, there were trade offs being made and and things of that nature that would kind of set the technology down one path or another. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it, uh, for sure. It, it, I mean, um, almost all design decisions, like the the, the coin limit, that's, that's the a coin big limit, one, of the having the yeah, yeah. But even with like how the scripts would work and things yeah. of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. What's a major like if you could just wave a magic wand and fix some mixing misconceptions that are in people's minds out there? Like, what would what might be one or two of those misconceptions that you would like to? like the fix <laughs> like you can only buy a whole bitcoin <laughs> i mean you never know what people are thinking out there you know <laughs> um i mean there's sort of two groups of people right people who are into bitcoin and people who are not to the people who are into bitcoin i would say like this is in no way guaranteed to work <laughs> I, I think it could fail it could absolutely fail we're, i don't think it will but it, it could you know, you have this, this this very strong conviction that it won't, and I think that's sometimes uh, there's big challenges out there. Like if one day the start the state starts attacking, they could easily win, uh, or easily they could win. I think. And then for people who are not into Bitcoin, volatility isn't nearly as bad as you think it is. This is short term perspective. Uh, that, that I find that very notable. Even now that people will bring up that it was like twenty it was worth twenty thousand six months ago and now it's six i guess that's unbelievable to me that's such a short-term perspective of looking at things i, I can't comprehend that you can't look past six months ago and see the gains over two three four five years what's a fun war story that, that you've been involved in because journalists you know in the battlefield of ideas uh it can get a little hot in the ring you could say yeah so, like what's a what's a fun war story not a not a place for the fan of heart <laughs> it's definitely not a place no uh, if you want to be a journalist in bitcoin this is this is something i've noticed as well where like bitcoin or crypto twitter it's it's a war out there it really is you will get a tax if you get something wrong or if you're um, misrepresenting something or or even if you're not, people just disagree with you, you'll get attacked by that. So uh, you, you, I think I and many others have really hard, hardened their skin over the years because you get attacked so much. And then sometimes you see a journalist from outside of the Bitcoin or crypto space sort of cover something and then they'll get attacked in the same exact same way as everyone, as else. everyone else does. And then they're like, "Oh, I'm done with Bitcoin or Twitter." I, yeah, I saw a... one. She was a she was an editor at uh, I think uh, Seeking Alpha or Financial Times or something, and she made some assertions and she got some rebuttals from Nick Zabo. Right. And then she like further made some assertions and he made some rebuttals and I mean. He, he just intellectually dominated her. Right. And she ended up deleting the original tweet and running away and not like right. <laughs> continuing in the debate. And it's like, well, you opened the door. <laughs> I think also this guy who had this new Satoshi revelation, quote unquote, about this guy writing a book or something. Oh, the Satoshi Nakamoto Family Foundation or whatever. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like, really? You guys are going to keep following for this? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that guy got attacked on Twitter, as you would expect. And, and rightly he, should be. You know, yeah. where's the proof? Exactly. Like, show me a signed message or like fake Satoshi can't even <laughs> sign a message with the alert key he doesn't until know, after he they did, were published. He didn't know what his signature was. <laughs> Either did Gavin, right? <laughs> I mean, there are, uh, there are a lot of war stories in this, yeah. in this space, especially yeah, if you're other, taking a public stance in it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it's also, it also, um, sometimes, you know, as a journalist, people will reach out to you when, in, uh, with something juicy or something like warish. Do you have, do you have an example of that? Yeah. So something that comes to mind that was interesting was this, uh, there was this bug in Bitcoin Unlimited. I don't know. There was a name for the bug, I think, but I don't remember what it was. Anyways, it, it crashed all these nodes at, at one point, like all these nodes crashed and, 
the woman or girl, although it could be a guy, it's probably a pseudonym, and I don't remember the name, but I think it was Catherine something. She had reached out to me telling me about like she had disclosure for some kind of bug in Bitcoin Unlimited. And so I wasn't really sure who this was or what I was looking at. And but she said it was like a blatantly obvious bug, and it was she was really startled by how 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 bad the code was in Bitcoin Unlimited. She was telling me this, and then it was. I hadn't even really gotten the chance to work in this article or, or, or work it out at least or publish anything or, and then the next day, the Bitcoin Unlimited guys fixed the bug. That's what happened. They fixed the bug, but the, did they even know how? Apparently they did know how. Yeah. And then, but it was so obvious that people noticed that something was fixed in the, in the code. But then all of these Bitcoin Limited nodes that were online, they had, didn't have a fix it, right? You need, first need to actually download the new fixed version. You can just deploy so, it across your 400 AWS instances. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so someone noticed this and, uh, and all of these nodes start crashing. So, and I had, I knew what was going on because this girl had contacted me and I see all these nodes crashing and it was like a big deal. Twitter was going crazy and everything. And then I remember, uh, Roger Ver was taking the, it was claiming that the Bitcoin Limited guys found the bug. Well, I knew that it was actually the security researcher that reached out to them. And because they didn't fix it immediately, or it was even because he got a nasty response or she wasn't happy with the response she got from Roger personally that she, uh, that she reached out to me. And now he was sort of claiming that they found the bug and they were like such great developers. It, it was just taking abuse of. So then I tweeted that out. I, I tweeted some segments of the email and then that blew up. So that was a, that was an interesting spectacle, at least from my perspective, where I, where I see all of this well, madness that, going on and sort of knowing what's going on. And then I see Roger lying about it or at least sort of twisting the truth. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes it very interesting in terms of what actually is the history. And, you know, the, we, we see revisionist history all over the place. I mean, right. Abraham Lincoln, he had drafted an arrest warrant for the Supreme Court of the United States. You know, he just hadn't acted on it. And yet he's heralded as like this uh, champion of the Constitution. And yet he wants to arrest the head of one of the other branches of government. Huh. So, I mean, it, like there. But so what actually gets out there in history is very interesting in terms of like what ideology agenda is trying to be pushed yeah for sure yeah i mean uh, as you as you mentioned that i've i've studied history for a bit and that's like a huge part of historian's job to figure out uh like to what extent could could a king of of, of the 1600s have meddled with the data that we're reading today like how do we know it's true and yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, you know, there, there are very few <laughs> journalists in the Bitcoin or even the crypto sphere that I think can tell their, their nose from their sphincter. Besides yourself, do you have any others that you kind of, uh, can speak highly about in terms of following their work? Like are there Kyle? other journalists? Yeah, Kyle's good, uh, for sure. I actually think the CoinDesk team is doing a pretty good job as well. They've improved a lot, I think. Over They've improved the, a lot. Over yeah. the past uh, year or two, yeah. I mean, there's, there are some mainstream journalists that are decent. I can't, I can't, I, I don't have them remembered. Uh, I don't remember the names. I've got like a short list at home actually with like yeah. guys I, that are decent. There are decent ones out there for sure. <laughs> so, you know, as we close up the interview, do you have a piece of advice for people on the other side of the microphone? Uh, you know, in this just very turbulent, <laughs> twisting and twirling, environment like what what kind of advice would you have for people uh so i I guess i'll sort of stick close to my journalist roots and that's uh do your own research as much as possible like even journalists even myself and uh, all other journalists we're doing our best or at least i know him i can make mistakes too and others can too and and don't take what anyone writes for gospel not even if it's the new york times and not even if it's bitcoin magazine well, thank you so much. That's been very helpful. We've had Aaron Van Wordham, technical editor at Bitcoin Magazine. Thanks so much for being with us. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at bitcoin.kn. 
Don't be shy. To help the show, share Bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise, spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate. Yeah.